I've been a developer, designer, web person for probably 15 years now. I did graphic design before that. And um, I've been freelancing for the last eight, sort of intermittently before that, but full time for the last eight years. And the reason I wanted to do this presentation tonight is because there's a lot of things in freelancing where if you have concepts about how particular components of it work, it's so much easier. And so what, I, what my hope is tonight is to communicate some of those concepts to you, give you some of the tools with which to work with them, and hopefully get your freelance business a little bit more organized so that you can be more effective, you can make more money, create more positive change in the world. So as you know, freelancing, as David mentioned, it's a burden sometimes. With that, it's, there's also incredible benefits. So it's always a juggle between how much am I working? Am I working too much? Am I working too little? Do I have clients in the pipeline? So today I'm going to talk about those things. The main gist <clears throat> is I'm going to talk about how to find your purpose in freelancing. What, what purpose does freelancing hold in your life? Why are you freelancing? What's your motivation for it? Because once you understand that a little bit, you can put it into your positioning statement. And the awesome thing about aligning your values and your purpose with what you're doing with your position is life flows much more easily. So for example, if you have a value of simplicity and you're working in a company where there's tons of bureaucracy and you're working on ancient platforms, you're going to go like this all the time with the basic principles of your work, right? So aligning those things makes a lot of sense. And the last is productivity, because we can all use productivity things. I've been thinking about productivity, how to make myself more productive, how do I use my energy better for years. And over the past few months, I've come up with a system that's allowed me to be way, way more productive, allowed me to estimate and anticipate projects as far as two months out with pretty great degree of accuracy. And I'll explain that a little bit. And, um, and time together. The biggest question with freelancing often, and I think that's part of the reason we have groups like this, is you don't know whether what you're doing is actually effective in the long run. Am I doing the right things? Am I billing properly? Am I trying to court my clients properly? All these types of questions we always have. And the challenge there is, now at least, there's so much information online that you kind of just get overwhelmed, like you said, Anna. It's like, oh my god. How do I even know where to start? So you start to read tons of articles and you storm in Evernote or whatever pocket. But what do you do with them ever? You never really apply them. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how to apply them, how you can sort of organize those ideas to actually be a framework that you can work with and tweak it as you go so that when something new comes in, it can be put into the framework without you having to be reinventing it all or just throwing it in another big bucket and hopefully maybe someday I'll read it. And um, as I said, the first piece with it is working with purpose. Purpose is interesting because oftentimes we're just working to work. We feel like we have all this stuff on our plate or we're doing things because we've always done them. But unless we actually sit down and look at the quality of the things that we're doing, Instead of just the quantity, it's just going to be more of the same. So you have to stop, you have to look at it, you have to pause. And that's hard in this day and age because we've always got a phone in our pocket. We've always got new alerts pinging in. There's always some new list of things to read in our email client. I mean, you guys know how it is. So we have to consciously disengage with that for a little bit and look at what we're actually doing. Is what we're doing effective? Does it lead towards where we want to be in our lives? So the first thing I want to talk about is end goals versus means goals. Ends goals are things like, well, actually, there's three, there's three categories of ends goals that research has shown most people tend to, tend to con consider. The first is experiences. So what do I want to experience in the world? The second is growth. How do I want to grow? Things like intellectual, skills, uh, character, health. Uh, and the last one is contribution. What do I want to contribute to the planet? Those three components, when put together, drive most people, whether consciously or not, 
there's some aspect of those in the way that they approach the world. So contributions are things like, you know, how do I, my family, I'm making sure that they have needs, or my friends, I'm providing food for them or resources, or even the planet, maybe I want to, you know, teach everybody how to do social media so that they can be more successful in their business, make sure their employees are taken care of. So that's sort of at the heart of it. I forgot that slide was in there. Um, the other aspect that's tricky is we're in a changing market. As a freelancer, we're always having to adjust. We don't know where things are coming from. And basically, we've chosen to take an unconventional career path. And that's challenging because we don't have the t traditional models for advancement. There's not, oh, I'm going to be the senior this next and healthcare is taken care of. We're kind of figuring that out for ourselves. So when considering that, looking at how is my life going? How, am I, how good am I at my craft? Those are the things that we need to start to look for when we're gauging our advancement, how well we're doing in our given field. And then looking at, am I honing my edge? Am I looking for challenges? Am I growing in those ways? Because typically work is uh, an employment type of situation is going to give you those opportunities whether you want them or not. You're like, okay, you either get demoted or pre promoted or laid off or whatever. You're, that's kind of out of your control. But as a freelancer, it's up to you to provide those opportunities for yourself. So the idea of sustainable is not what we typically think of now with all this eco stuff that we're talking about. I mean, sustainable in the true sense of the word. Can this be kept up? Will this last? That's what I mean when I talk about sustainable freelancing. So when you're thinking about advancement, the better you are at what you do, the more you can get paid, the bigger projects you work on. That's freelance advancement. I now am working on way higher level than I was when I started. I can charge more. I'm able to have more control over the projects because people respect what I'm doing because they know what I'm talking about. That's a great motivator. Um, one other thing that really helps is looking for opportunities for leverage. So as freelancers, it's typical that we don't really have a lot of leverage because we're either working for ourselves and the clients that we can win as one person, which is typically pretty small for developers and designers. You have a unique situation in training that you can actually reach more people. But leverage allows you to focus on what those goals are that you have, those life goals, those ends goals, and say, where can I apply the, most effort, or the least amount of effort for the most amount of effect? The other cool thing is when you, when you figure out your values, you're able to put your subconscious to work for you. Because what happens is anytime we make a decision, we run it through our values. Sometimes we listen and sometimes we don't. So let's say you have a value of honesty and you're making a, a relationship with somebody and you hear that they say something a little bit you know is not right and they're kind of misleading somebody. That's a disconnect with your values. And so when you work in alignment with your values, those sorts of things just happen. The things smooth out because you're connected with that. So here, here's some of my values. They're listed in priority. It's a fun exercise to try and find a whole list of values. Go through them. What, what resonates with me? And then try and organize them. Once you identify these types of things, it's pretty clear simplicity is one of my values, you know, looking at my slides. If you've seen my website, it kind of has the same quality. When I work with people, are they interested in the simple solutions? Are they interested in things that are beautiful and full of quality? Do they respect the natural environment? Those are all things that I hold true. And when I find clients and when I put myself out there with those values at the center, you can bet there's going to be synergy. And they're much more excited to work with me because they know that we're values aligned. Especially in this day and age, there's so many people doing the type of work that we, want, that we do. If you can put your shingle out there with a little bit of something on it that shines a bit for those people, don't you want to work with people who have the same values as you do? So why not use that as part of your pitch? So here's a really quick and easy way to figure out what, how, to, how to get that angle on what your values are and your motivation. There's two lists. I was just sharing this with Phil. What gets you up in the morning? What are you excited to do in the morning? What projects are really enth you're enthusiastic about? What are the things that really get you fired up? And what are the things that keep you up at night? Maybe it's just as simple as getting food on the table. That's fine. 
Maybe you want to change the world and get water to everybody in Africa. Like, awesome. But make those clear. Put them up in front of you because those helped give you direction. And when you have that direction, that's what people want. They want people who are passionate about their work. They want people who can articulate clearly why they're doing what they're doing. What's awesome about having those things articulated is then you can put them into your positioning, your brand. Because essentially, as a freelancer, you're your brand. And it comes down to the minute you pick up that phone and you start talking to someone, when you send that email, when you meet them, every single interaction is an opportunity to, con to reinforce your brand. And when you're clear about what you're trying to communicate, it's easy. You can be yourself if you've aligned with your values. And that's where the power is. Because if you're trying to portray yourself as, say, a team or an agency, who on their website says, we, you know? That's always a sort of like moral dilemma. Do I say we or do I say me if it's just me? Probably say you're a single person. If you group with other people, then you can talk about team. But if it's just you, there's no reason to be misleading. Because ultimately, honesty equals trust. And if you have clients that trust you, you're way ahead of the game. Because then they're going to listen to what you have to say. They're going to take your advice. They know you have, your they know you have their best interests in mind. It's a lot easier to work. So how do we get there? Part of being a designer, and you know, tell me if this is not the case for developers as well, is being empathetic. Especially now when we're building web applications, you have to be thinking like the user, right? So why not just apply that to your client? Think like them. What are the things that they need? Typically when you have that first meeting or that phone call, if you're asking decent questions about you know, prompting them to tell you more about what they need, they're going to tell you exactly how they want the, the deliverables, what sort of mood they want you to communicate in. They're going to tell you all that stuff. So if you're just listening and writing it down, don't be talking over them. You're not the expert yet. They're the expert. You need to learn from them about what they're trying to do, what their business is. And until you can do that, until you can clearly articulate the goal of their project, shut up. Listen to them. And they'll tell you, and you say, oh, great, you have this particular need. Well, great, I have these particular skills. And if you can pitch it right, which I'll show you in a minute, how to angle what your skills are for, with what their need is to tell them what future you're going to put them in, that's what they want to hear. So to get, generate the material for your pitch, there's a few things you want to think about those values that I talked about before. Your assets are things like your skills, the technologies that you have available to you, the other team members that you might have as a resource, aspirations and values, that's pretty clear. And then what are the market realities? What do people actually want? I'll put the slides up later too so you guys can see all these. This chart is brilliant. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it right now, but this guy's awesome. Check it out, read it, study it, learn it. It's really good stuff. So here's my pitch. It's a little unrefined. I'm not really a writer, so for what it's worth. But I have values in there. I'm identifying who my target audience is. That's these people down at the bottom, visionaries, innovators, and change makers. I'm telling them how I'll do it, using the web experience and sharp thinking. That could be a little bit more refined you know, articulating specific technologies if that's what they're looking for, but I'm tending to move more into strategic types of thinking, so they don't really care about strategy at that point. What they want to see is, what's the outcome that I can get from that? So that needs some tweaking there, but you get the idea. Start with your business name, start with a positioning statement, and you'll be leaps and bounds above everybody else, because that is how you can then pitch yourself. Hey, here's what I do, here's who I am, Put it on the website, let people connect with that. There's enough people out in the world, the chances are they're going to find you if you haven't already identified them. So I talked about the story test in the uh, description. And basically what I mean by that is everything on your website, every time you interact with someone, every email you send, is part of a story that you're telling your clients. And it's important to identify what that story is. Ideally, it's going to correspond with your pitch 
It's going to correspond with your values and it's going to correspond with what you have heard them say they need. So looking at your, at your web and your in-person experience and saying, what story is that telling? Am I just a WordPress developer or do I build business platforms to help you be more successful? Like, I'm basically still a WordPress developer, but it's how I, how I position it. What's the story I'm telling? Who are you? Why do you do what you do? What can you do for your clients? Those are the critical pieces that they need to know. It can be short, it can be to the point, preferably in fact. And the critical piece is, does your portfolio back it up? So what I mean when I talk about the story of your portfolio is, if you look at anybody's portfolio, the types of clients they have, the types of industries that those clients are in, the style of design, the range of different types of pieces, those all tell a story to a prospective client. So I come onto a website and it's a bunch of auto industry things. Great, okay, that's probably auto industry. You know, he's gonna be well versed in that. I'm a flower shop, I'm probably not gonna hire an auto industry guy. You don't have to put everything in your portfolio. Cull it down. Do four case studies of your best projects that are in the demographic that you want to identify with. Or better yet, make a landing page for a specific industry and put the portfolio links or the case study links on that page for just those, those specific industries. So I, I work in the outdoor industry as well. So I have a page, brasilia.com slash outdoor. It's got a couple, couple uh, recommendations or uh, testimonials. It's got some links to projects. It's got some calls to action that are specifically for that industry. Doesn't mean that I can't service other clients, but on the sites that I do that link to that, or that are in the outdoor industry, in the footer link to my website, guess where it links? Brasilia.com slash outdoors. So they're not going to go to my home page, which is a bit more generic. They get a customized landing page. So that's what I mean when I talk about telling a story. Look at what story you're telling in all your materials. What story does your business card say? Are you using your own name for the business? Or are you using a custom name? Those things start to tell a story. So be conscious that you are telling a story at all points. And it's important to remember that we as human beings, we learn through story. Everything, oral history back till now. I'm telling you stories today. We're learning through those stories. That's how we're wired. The other critical piece for telling the story is generating this list here. Your past basically is the sum total of all the experiences you've had, the work history, travel you've done, languages you know, all those different things. Your services are currently what you're offering to the world. Then the client's future is basically your past with their goals to serve a specific need that they have to get them to a new future. If you can paint that picture for somebody, you're way ahead of the game as well. Because basically then, you've sold them on where they need to go and where they're gonna get, how they're gonna get there is through you with your particular skills. Take time to go down this list, write out a big old document. It's gonna be so valuable to you to have this because anytime you need to write a resume, there it is. Anytime you have a new client or you're not quite sure how to sell to them, they tell you, I need this. Yeah, great, okay, let me get back to you with an estimate and a proposal and things like that. Go here, what are their needs? Where are they trying to go? Do I have skills that can apply to that? Yeah, great, I did this project, that project. You know, I actually traveled in Thailand a while, so I learned some great stuff about you know, Thai culture and how their art goes, so it'd be perfect for your project. Who knows, those things tie in and that's what people are looking for. And if you have stories about that past, all the better because then you can say, here's how I affected this client in the past or this project in the past and here's how I can apply that to this future that I'm gonna take you to. So when you're figuring out positioning, you guys know Simon Sinek, is that his name? The guy, the TED, TED Talk, why? He's written a couple books and stuff like that. He's on to something. If you can articulate why you're doing something, then you have clarity, 
You can speak clearly to your clients on terms of how you're going to be able to serve them. Put it in terms of benefits for them and get someone to help you with the writing if you're not a writer. So the cool thing about this is once you've identified types of clients that you can service, looking at your past, looking at what services you have right now, looking at who's, who's available to you, what clients are looking for work, you can start to look at your project portfolio. And the reason I call it a project portfolio is if you think about it just as like my project list, what happens is it just becomes a list to get through. But if you think about it a little bit more holistically, the project portfolio talks about, if you think about it like an investment portfolio, where do I put my resources to best serve my goals, my end goals? Is this new project that's coming in actually going to benefit where I want my portfolio story to go? Maybe you just need to pay the bills. That's fine. Look at the project portfolio as a whole to say, yeah, okay, it kind of fits into this type of work that we're doing. Or you know what? This is not a project that I really want to take on because it's not going in the direction that I want to work in. Because often what happens is we just take in projects, we're just taking projects, and it just gets this whole list. But when you look at them holistically, you can start to see how they relate to one another. And hey, you know what? Something I learned over here really could apply to this new project here. And unless you step back, here's that pause again, giving yourself time to reflect. Unless you reflect, you're just going to be right down, doing the work, doing the work, doing the work, and you can't be strategic about it. So I want to talk about the project portfolio a little bit and what's necessary and why it's, why it's important to think about it in terms of this way. So basically, all you really need to manage your pro project portfolio is a list, project name, time and effort estimate, deadlines, and what are the goals of the project, and your brain. It's pretty simple. It's really just a concept. This is one of the concepts I was talking about. If you start to think about it, how I can manage this, how do these pieces work together, you can start to be strategic. And I've even had situations where I've had two clients that are able to start working together because I'm looking at it from that perspective and saying, you know what? This client can serve this client wonderfully. So why don't you guys get together? I'll facilitate it. Awesome work. I'm able then to double the amount of effort or reduce the amount of effort that I have to do to manage those clients, and everybody's happy in the end. When you're doing a project portfolio, there's a couple components to it. There's a sales pipeline, basically what's coming in, and there's the operations pipeline, what's on my plate right now and how do I manage that. <clears throat> this is a little bit of project management, not just project portfolio management, but I think we can all use a little bit of that too. And basically, the sales pipeline says these things. What do I have lined up? What's coming in? When will it sell? When, is it, when are they ready to get going? And do I actually have the resources to execute on this type of project? Do I need to hire more people and stuff like that? And we'll see that in a minute. And this is important because as a freelancer, you're responsible for this. If you're not looking in this perspective, well, you're going to have those gaps where you don't have any work. And you're like, great, OK, now I start my sales. Too late. You should be doing a little bit of sales all the time. And I'll talk about how to fit that into your schedule in a minute. So this is the operations pipeline. How many hours a week can I actually bill for? How many hours a week do I actually have to get work done? It's probably much less than you think. I average about 20 to 25 of billable hours. The rest of it is either time I've taken off, or managing the business, or new business development, all those sorts of things. How do, you, how do you schedule? How do you schedule a project that's two months long, but is, you know, they're slow to get back to you. So it's like, okay, I got a day waiting for them to get back. You got two projects happening. Right now, I actually have seven projects going on. That's a lot of projects. But if you manage it properly, and you get a little help when you need it, you can make it work. But you have to be really conscious of your operations pipeline. Then, of course, do I hire, hire help for that? I've hired a few people, and I personally found that the, the management of, of them in, the con in that context is often as much effort as it would be for me to do it. So just be conscious of that. Not to say that you shouldn't hire people. There's definitely situations where 
if you're collaborating, it can, be, it can really double your output or maybe a half again your output. But if you're giving them a job to do and then you're going over and doing something else, there's a lot of management that tends to happen there unless you got a good one. People who manage themselves are very, very worth it. In all that mucky muck and trying to figure out how do I get my project schedule operating properly, if you're, if you're a freelancer, subcontracting, either hiring someone or getting hired yourself is a great way to stabilize things. And what, what it basically allows you to do, and the reason I have it in here as an option, is if you can get some contracts where there's an ongoing relationship with, say, an agency or you know, a bigger client, that allows for those gaps when you still need to do sales to be a little bit more evened out, unless you've got really good cash flow management skills and you've got you know, the six months in savings that they suggest. I don't know anybody who's got six months of work in, or pay in savings, but. Um, so I work for a couple local agencies. I do some work for The Engine is Red, for Zach Darling Creative Associates, and a few others that basically, when they need my types of services, they'll call me up and be like, hey, I'd like to get on your schedule. We have a project coming up. They know I schedule about two months out, and so they're willing to work with that because I'm reliable, I do good quality work, I manage myself. So being somebody who is great to work with goes a long way towards making subcontract situations great. It's typical in the industry that you'll give a discount for your rate when you're doing it, but I typically don't because I am very well self-managed. So if I'm going to be on your project, I'm gonna be delivering top quality work. You're not gonna to have to manage me. I'm always gonna be on time. I'll let you know if there's a problem. So if you can deliver on those sorts of things, you can still charge your normal rate. If you're not, you got to cut your rate because they're managing you. And unless that person who's hiring you is making a real uh, penny on what you're doing, they're not going to hire you back. Keep looking at your whole list of projects. That's the basic takeaway here. And charge for project management at least 3%, sometimes as high as 25. Depends on what, your, what kind of projects you're managing. If you're a subcontractor and just doing development, there's typically not a lot of project management. Sometimes there's tons of project management and it eventually ends up evening out in the wash, but make sure you charge for that time. So I talked a little bit about working with other people. This is where that really comes into play. Basically, every single situation where you're interacting with somebody, if you're providing value to them, they're going to keep working with you. So one of the things that I do sort of unconsciously is I'm always recommending books to people, sending them articles. It's just part of who I am, the way I operate. So I have a client like, you know what? I read this article. Send it to them. They're going to love that because it shows you're thinking of them. You have a meeting with them. Provide them value in the meeting. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Are you meeting their objectives? So think about what they're trying to do. Take some time to actually parse the problem. Einstein once said, you give me an hour to solve a problem, I'm gonna spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. The real value is understanding what you're actually trying to do. So a perfect example is like drill manufacturers. You would think they're in the, they're in the business of selling drills, right? They're actually selling holes. You buy a drill bit so you can have a hole. So think about your business in the same way. What am I actually providing? Better yet, think about your client's business in the same way. What are they actually providing here? You come up with that kind of insight in the meeting, bam, you're in. So that's what I mean by providing value. Use all these articles that you read to apply your wisdom to their business. That's where the real value comes from. Are you improving their condition? So back to that list that I showed you before, the client futures, any of those things. Am I improving performance? Does their brand look better? Are they able to make more profit? Is their service, is their uh, support cost down? All those different things are ways that we provide value. So identify what those are. Typically in your first meeting, if you're not asking what their metric for success for the project is, 
you've failed. Because if you don't know what target you're trying to hit by the end of the project, how do you know that you've done what you, that they ask you to do? Make sure you identify. And you may have to come up with the metric. You may have to say, you know what? I know you have no idea about you know, AdWords, so here's what it means to be successful. We can expect a 15% open rate in emails in this industry. But you know what? If we can increase that by 10%, awesome. So OK, that's your metric then to work, work against. And I'll say, don't ever say you're going to do anything more than 10% above what it currently is. <laughs> if you go more, awesome. But you can probably hit 10%. That's just a consulting little tidbit there. And are you delighting them? Are you fun to work with? Are you interesting to work with? Are you bringing things to the table? I'm a Waldorf student, so I have a client. He's a son Edison, you know, high mucky muck. I know his kids in a Waldorf school. So we had sat down for a beer after work one day. <clears throat> Very unusual. It was sort of like, okay. But I opened, I'm like, hey, what do you know about anthroposophy? Yes or no? And he's like, but that's a really interesting subject. And he was like, wow. So we had this incredible conversation. He really opened up. We were able to go to a place that was way different than it would have been like, OK, what's your business trying to do? Like, make it real. These are other human beings who are trying to make their stuff happen in the world, too. And if you connect with them at that level, it can be so much more fun. Because then it's not just this dry business stuff. It's human beings working together. And what else are we looking for as freelancers when we're all there isolated? I want to work with people so that we can interact and make things happen. So I'm going to reiterate this point. Their experience with you is so, so valuable to them and to you. You can charge twice as much if you give them a like, white glove, red carpet experience. You can double it, triple it. And if you're totally there, you're present to them, you're asking the right questions, you're answering their calls when they get to you, you can charge way more. And they're happy to pay it, because who doesn't like to be taken care of? All that time that you spend on the phone with them, make it an enjoyable thing. Leave your issues at home. Those are for home. You're running your business here. Remember, you're the brand. You're not just there pushing code for them. You're providing value for them and their business. And if you can articulate that clearly to them in terms that they can understand, they're happy to pay you. I don't have clients who don't pay because they know the value that I'm delivering for them. And they, I tell them it clearly. It's in the contract usually, or at least the proposal. Here's what you're going to get. And then afterwards, let's circle around. Did you get that? Yeah, great. OK, we're all on the same page. They're happy. Here's the check. So if you can identify what you're bringing, you're good. So how do you get all that stuff done? Ball holding their hand, making sure that you've got your pipeline full making sure that you're handling what you do. So that's where productivity comes in. With the internet now, being productive is hard. You know? There's always something to be grabbing your, grabbing your eyeballs. I often say that we're in an attention economy. Because basically, the thing that everybody buys and sells on website is your attention. Whether it's ads, an article, they're trying to get your attention. That's what they're working for. So if you can identify that, great. But now we've got to fight against it, too, because it's trying to get our attention when we're trying to get work done. So we're in a place, we're in an industry, we're in a world where more, bigger, faster is sort of the default mode. But the challenge with that is it gets you narrow, shallow, and short-term results. Because you don't have the time to really go to depth with it. So in order to be effective with that, we need to structure our routine a little bit so that we can actually have preset amounts of time to take care of the things that we need to, be articulate about how the things that we've done will influence the things that we're going to do so that we can know, great, that took three hours now. Next time I do that, it's probably going to be a little bit faster, but I know what I'm expecting. There's, um, there's a fellow named Tony Schwartz. And uh, he's, he's big into energy. And he, he showed me this idea 
called a, it's a ultradian rhythm. And basically, you guys are familiar with a circadian rhythm, right? That's the 24-hour rhythm of our body's cycles. An ultradian rhythm is a cycle within that 24 hours, shorter than 24 hours. And he talks about one for our personal energy. And basically, we have an energy rhythm. Every 90 minutes or so, we need to take a break. That's just the way our bodies operate. You'll notice if you're ever in longer meetings, a two-hour meeting, at 90 minutes, everyone's like... <sighs> so I, I don't schedule meetings longer than 90 minutes. But what's interesting about it is if you don't take that meeting, you get tired, you get irritable, you lose focus. Like, it's really clear. And so what I've done is I looked at that and said, okay, well, how can I use that to my advantage? So I've broken my day up into four chunks, four 90-minute chunks. There's a half-hour break in between each. Take a lunch for a half hour. And the beauty in that is you're actually using your body's natural rhythms to support the work that you're doing. Give yourself the time to regenerate so that you can be performing and giving real value whenever you're sitting down at your work. So here's what my day looks like a little bit. 9 to 9.30, 11 to 12.30, 1 to 2.30, and 3 to 4.30. I found, for me, that my most creative time is in the morning. So I schedule those two blocks. I don't open my email client first thing in the morning. If you do, you just shot that first half of the day. Because what happens? Your mind zooms off onto a thousand other things, and you feel productive. Yeah, I cleared out all, that, all those newsletters I get. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, that's real value. And in the afternoon, I take that time to prioritize. After lunch, I say, what did I do in the morning? Great. These were the things that I got done. I didn't get quite as far on that. So I'll reprioritize my afternoon, and I'll take care of it. I'll take care of most of the communication, phone calls, meetings, everything like that, in the afternoon when I don't need to be quite so sharp. The advantage of doing this is that you can start to look at larger time frames. So I know I have four blocks a day. Immediately I know how many blocks a week I have, right? So I can start to estimate as far out as I know I can estimate one and a half hour chunks. So I can break down a project and say, you know what, this project is going to take you know, 60 hours. All right, so I'll break it down even further into, this, into the subtasks as necessary, but I can schedule that out because I know how long it's going to take, and I know how much time I have. So this is, I have a whiteboard in my office where I kind of put things on it, and I break it up based on how long the clients, you know, whether I need to have a client meeting, or, okay, that deadline's coming up, so I need to accommodate for that. Here I've got a meeting all day in Belmont. Here I've got a Brasilla, Brasilla time, so I focus two blocks a week, on my business, making sure that I have time to meet with my wife who helps me with you know, scheduling meetings or those sorts of things, and handling email, new proposals. And here's another one. This is, that's my little meeting icon. And uh, at a glance, this sits across the room. A client calls, hey, when can I have a meeting? I just go, look over here, you know what? Uh, this week's full, but I have an open block next week, Friday afternoon. I can see at a glance, and because I'm chunking it in these 90-minute chunks, there's a, there's a lag when you switch projects, when you go from one sort of conceptual thing to another. It's about a half an hour. You try and do that in a 90-minute chunk, or even you know, 10 times during your day, I'll handle that email, I'll jump into this project for a little bit, handle that email, Oop, I'll give a call. You've totally shot your day. Because the time to get deep into a project is pretty big. And so if you stay in that project and don't constantly jump back and forth, you're way more effective. You can have that depth I was talking about. You're not just skirting along the top. You sink into it. Really, you're able to solve problems. And you can see in here, I had from 11.30 to 5 on one project awesome because I can sink into it. I know I'm not going to be disturbed or interrupted. I don't open my email client. I don't really get on Facebook very often. And so I know I'm able to solve the real tricky problems. I can provide a ton of value in that time because it's focused thinking time. 
It depends on how busy I am. Okay. Yeah, it depends on how busy I am. Typically, I say it's, you got to get out of the office. Right. Go to the bathroom, get a cup of tea. I work at home, so I go out in my garden and you know, sit. sit. Yeah, whatever I need to do. If I'm super busy, I may take that little half hour of time in between. Maybe I'll do a 10 minute break and then like, OK, they've been pinging me for emails or calling or whatever. Right. But I try to avoid that because that's putting my head in a different place. Right. As I've worked, I can watch my consciousness move back and forth between things. And if I'm really trying to solve a sticky problem, like I'm trying to write an algorithm for a program, if I, if I in any way skirt out of it, I've got to sort of reload that thinking back in. So I try to avoid jumping out into, uh, into other things when possible. One of the other cool things about this is I set Friday afternoon as a networking time. So if somebody calls and is like, hey, I want to have coffee, let's get together, Friday afternoon. If it's busy, OK, next week, the one after that. It might be three weeks before I get with someone, but I know that I'm going to be able to be totally present for that. Again, providing value in that interaction. How can I be present to what I'm doing all the time so I'm not having to be jumping back and forth and a thousand things? It's like I said, I'm managing seven projects right now. I can do it because I'm focused on one thing at a time. We suck at multitasking. I'm sure you've seen the articles. It's a myth. Don't try it. You're just wasting your time. Do one thing at a time. If you need to shift, make it clear that you're shifting. Mm -hmm. A question. Uh, what's your policy on incoming phone calls for clients that have emergencies? I do a real hard sort of line on that. If you have an emergency, then you can call or text or something like that. But typically, I train my clients, you don't get even same day service. Because I had a client recently, she, I was too busy. And I said, you know what, it's going to be about three weeks out before I can get to your project. And she said, OK, you know, I, we need this right away. The person I'm working with wants to do it really fast. So they, I gave her a few recommendations. And she eventually found her own developer. She worked with this lady, and here's what we need. The woman says, yes, great. Next day, it's done. And it wasn't anything like what they needed, because she hadn't taken the time to sit down, listen to the client. What are your needs? Let's get clear about this. Do we understand one another? Boom. So she wasted you know, $1,000, three days of time. For what? She came back to me and said, I'd like to wait, please. So uh, that's sort of how I try to work. Like, we don't need to work at a breakneck speed. That's you, a choice. You take, during your 90-minute productivity periods, do you take phone calls or just let it go to voicemail? Yeah, it's always to voicemail. I have Google Voice, so most of the time, I don't even need to listen to the voicemail. I read it in my email, and I can either reply in email when it's convenient for me, or at the end of the day, I typically have you know, 4, 4.30 to 5, I'll have a phone call time where those important things can be handled if necessary. And then ultimately, chill out, man. I was just talking to Philip about how busy and crazy this type of work is. There's always somebody who wants something done. As freelancers, we're the go-to person for a bunch of different people. They all think that they're God's gift to, the, to you, and they want it done right now. So you need to be the arbiter of that time to say, you know what, here's the timeline for it. You might lose some work for it, but ultimately, is it worth your health? Is it worth your sanity? Is it worth your family life? That's what's sustainable about it. Set the limits. Be clear about what the expectations are. Communicate it, and there's no confusion. If that doesn't work for them, great. I'm sure you can find someone who's ready to jump on it for you. But if you want quality work with full focus, I'm happy to work with you. So I say active relaxation because we all sit way too much. <laughs> go hiking. Go play with your kids out back. Go swimming. Like those sorts of things. Do yoga. Don't sit and watch TV. Don't play video games. Like really, is that serving you at all? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and lastly, sleep. Sleep loss is mind loss. Just keep that in there. We don't sleep enough as a culture. So there's a few tools that I've found really helpful to manage this sort of workflow. The first is rescue time. And basically it's an application which sits in your, on your computer and it watches what's the frontmost application and the title of it and it just tracks that. And then you can go to their website and you can prioritize, or uh, not prioritize, you basically say, is this productive time that I was spending here or unproductive time? And once you've marked it tw once, then it recognizes that as, oh, great, you did this much time today of design or this much communication or you were in Google Docs this much. I'll show you a screenshot in a sec. The second one is time bar. I just discovered this the other day. <clears throat> and what it basically is, it's a menu bar application for Macs. I don't know if they have a PC version. And what, it, what you do is you click on it, you input a time, and it turns your menu bar into a progress bar. And it's just like a light blue that moves across for the time that you've allocated. So I have that set for my 90 minute chunk. Any given time within it, I can just glance and get a ballpark for how I'm doing on time. Okay, I'm about halfway done. Yeah, I'm, I need to hurry up or I need to slow down or great, I'm almost done and I've got another half an hour. It's just a quick way of gauging. Get yourself an analog watch too. If you want to, talk to me about digital clocks after. Some really weird stuff that messes with your head. Um, and then match your, by looking at the data here, you can match your mental, ta mental state to the task at hand. So like if I showed you I do my creative work in the morning, I know I'm fresh then. So with rescue time, you can actually look at when you do stuff. So I just took a screenshot this afternoon. This is my day to day. You can see design, design and composition like 9 a.m., 10 a.m., Okay, so I was doing a lot of design this afternoon. You can look at changes over time to see like, okay, well typically I do most of my communication in the morning or in the afternoon. You can start to look at those patterns and really get valuable data about how your work habits are. So like, I was pretty good today, 88% productivity. I don't know what that little, you know, the little red space in it, but it's like, you know, if you were on Facebook or, you know, TechCrunch or whatever, they already marked those as distractions as non-productive time, so you don't have to do a lot of work, but you get good, good insight into how, how your work habits are affected throughout the day and whether you actually did what you said you would. It's pretty, it's pretty telling. So here's how you can create your own system. It's really easy, actually. I know it sounds all complicated. I've been thinking about this stuff for years, so it, it seems a little bit more complicated, but basically, in any given situation, Let's say you're working a social media campaign and you're like, you know what? I feel like I could be doing this more effectively. So just start writing down, like, here's where I am right now. What's the next step? I'll think about it a sec. I've read all these articles. What's the next best step that I know to do for this activity? Write it down and do it. And watch it. Did it work? Oh, no, okay. So then strike through, revise. Let's try another one next time. Once you've written down those patterns, functionally you have a system for doing that particular piece. And that's the real goal in running your own business is if you can processize these sort of repetitive components of your business, you then free up your mental resources to bring real value. You can hand that off to an assistant even if you wanted because you've written it down. Any real big high level successful business, this is how they all run. They're all processes. They're all predetermined processes. They drop another person into that role. Here's the handbook, rock and roll. We can take advantage of it too. So I know that's a little bit cryptic, but essentially, if you have a routine, something that you can just kind of rely on, if any of you have kids, watch it. If you have a routine, they're so much easier to work with because they just know what's happening next. You don't have to think about it. In fact, I read an article a little while ago about Obama. He has, I think, seven of the exact same outfits in his closet. He eats the exact same thing every day. He has the same exercise routine at the exact same time every day. Because why? 
the Secret Service needs to know where he is. <laughs> That's one aspect, but who's familiar with the idea of executive function? The, the, the fewer decisions you have to make every day, the more bandwidth you have for the really big decisions. Exactly. So our executive function is the part of us that helps us make decisions. It controls our willpower, things like that. And every time we have to make a decision, well, what are we having for breakfast? Okay, I gotta go over there, and take my mind out of where I'm at, look in the fridge, okay, what do I wanna do? So I have a little routine, like, here's the basic components of breakfast each day of the week. I can mix and match them, but it's like bread and eggs on Wednesday. So I might make French toast, I might make pancakes, I might just have bread and eggs, but I know that those are the components. I don't have to think about it then. So then when I get into work, I'm fresh. I'm, you know, I'm cooking dinner for the, or breakfast for the whole family, get my kids to school. Like, it's just the routine. You run it. So the more of that you can do, the more of your resources are freed up for real creative thinking, setting your business up properly, doing good work. So with all that, it's important to recognize that we need to, we need to look at how we've done in order to be able to understand and build those systems. What did we do that worked? What did we do that didn't work? And unless we take the time to pause and stop and acknowledge that we're actually doing good things, you're going to burn out quick. So there's a few things that I found helpful in managing that aspect of it. Have measurable goals. So one of the things I use is I have Harvest. It's a time tracking application. They have budgets, like you can either do time budgets or money budgets or things like that for different, for different projects. And I'll set up actually even the different individual tasks within it. So I'll, I have a task of like code and build. There's another task that's launch. And I've identified when I'm launching a website how much, those thing, how much time those things take. So whenever I look at Harvest, I immediately can see like, wow, I'm almost done with that project. And I've gotten all these aspects of it done. But the one that I like the most is to look at What's the income for the month? I have a certain number of hours that I need to work per month at my rate to f support my family. And so I can go in there and I can see, this week I've worked this many hours. And then, oh, hey, yeah, you know what? I worked really hard today. I went down to Belmont and was in meetings all day. Great, I just put 12 more hours on the clock. Boom. That's really motivating because it's those small incremental goals that we set up for ourselves that allow us to feel like we're moving forward. I will say, though, make sure they're in the service of those ends goals. I'll talk a little bit about ends goals if you'd like. There's some, there's some interesting ideas in there. The other thing is a done list. I used to have a Google Doc that I put my schedule into. And basically, it was just a running doc where I'd add a new week, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. What are the things that I need to be doing each day with a dash in front of them? And as I went through the week, I'd change that dash to a plus to indicate that I successfully completed that, that component. And every day I'd go in there and look at it, it's like it would just get longer and longer. I could see the last week, yeah, man, look at all that stuff I did. That's really satisfying to have that articulated so clearly. There's actually an application, it's a web app, it's called idonethis.com. <laughs> and basically what they do is they send you an email every day at the end of the day and if you reply to it with what you've done as a new line for each item and s send it back to them, they pull it into their system, they'll track it, and there's a, like a calendar where you can look at what happened. And in addition to that email that you get, it has a little list at the bottom of like, what were you doing six months ago at this time? Or what did you get done this week? And so it's just a way of reinforcing that you're making progress. You know, it's so easy as you're, as you're continuing to work to see the situation where the money comes in and then it goes out. Another client comes and they leave. Like, you just start to feel like you're sort of, I mean, I think that's probably what you're talking about, David. Just stuff's just kind of moving through and it's kind of like, okay, another day. But if you have these things that you can look at to say like, yeah, stuff's happening. It's really, 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 really motivating. And the last one is feature is, or failure is feedback. Every time you fail at something, like you don't win that project bid, or you know, someone like, is unhappy with the presentation that you just gave, you, know, you showed them the designs, and they're like, ah. 
It's just feedback. But if you can think about it that way, it's a learning opportunity. Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. Now I can take that, I can put it into my system, I can learn, and I can get better. Because remember, that's one of the things that we're lacking is the external approval. Yes, boss, here's your annual review. You did well, you didn't. Okay, thank you. We don't have that. But this is an indication. How are you doing? Failure or positive feedback? So the challenge with working for yourself is you don't know how you did often. Like you did launch a website and, well, it's sort of correlation. It's not causation when you see a certain number of hits on something. Like I, I think that's what that was a result of my actions, but it's the web. You know, it's a weird and woolly world out there. So thinking about these things <clears throat> allows us to identify places where we can actually get better. I mentioned this last year, good data is good business. And this really gives you a huge opportunity to make sure that you're able to articulate clearly the value you have to clients, but also to yourself. Am I doing well in what I'm doing? It gives you that motivation again. So I do something once a year. I, it's the annual review, I call it. And basically, I have a few different pieces that I go into. The first is the clients and projects. So I'll look at my client and project list and ask these questions of it. What was the best paying client? What were great learning opportunities? Where maybe I didn't get paid so much or the project failed, but I really learned a lot. And if you've written it down and made notes about it, you're not going to do that mistake again, or you can repeat it. Who are my anchor clients? Who are the ones that consistently come back to me with good projects, they're fun to work with, they pay on time? Those are your anchor clients. You want to treat them very well. I had one lady who I met at one of these meetings four or five years ago. Very unassuming lady, really sweet. She paid me like 40 grand last year with just these little projects that kept coming through. Like, she's an anchor client. Her business is pretty small, but she's able to do that. So I'm going to service her well. It's projects that I like to work on. That's really valuable. I've said before um, in other presentations, but I'll say it again, 80% of your business should be repeat. If you're not getting numbers close to that, something's wrong. Because if you're just pushing them out the door and like, hey, bye, you're missing an opportunity, either for a maintenance agreement or you know, maybe there's a social media campaign associated or an SEO campaign that they'd like to do with it. There's always new projects that people are thinking of. You're sending them new leads about how to more effectively run their business. Those should all be, I mean, they are. They're warm leads. They're hot leads. So if you're wondering where the next client's going to come from, look in your own client roster. Maybe there's someone you haven't done work with in six months who's like, where did that web developer go? And you know, you're like, hello, I've always been here, but for some reason they always seem to think we disappear. So be in front of them. Make a point of acknowledging that, hey, how's your business going? That project we launched, how did it go? You might get some stats that you can put on your website. Win. And then are they telling your ideal portfolio story? Remember what I talked about before. Is that, is that a story that you want? And then the purpose and pleasure aspect of it. Are they aligned with your values? Are they, are they serving the end goals that you've set up for yourself and identified? Did you enjoy working on them? If not, OK, well, then I want to strike that client off. Sometimes it's worth firing a client or disappearing. <laughs> and then lastly, make sure you update that list I talked about earlier. This one here. Keep that updated. This should be your go-to piece. This is so, so important. I can't, I can't say it strongly enough. If you have this, you're so set for clearly articulating what the value you have to clients is, et cetera, et cetera, everything I already said. So take the time to do this. It's really, really worth it. That's what we we're trying to cover today. There's the rules of thumb. Thanks. Um, you meant just going over some of the tools. Uh, I gathered a Google Docs and a Harvest. Um, and I got worked down to the um, the apps. Do you have any other like uh, services you use most? 
Um, it depends. It kind of depends on what I'm trying to do. You know, I mean, productivity tools are a dime a dozen. Really, I think the ones, the ones that save me the most time are things like Harvest, a time tracker that integrates with my computer and has the invoicing built in. Some sort of proposal system that allows me to generate proposals quickly out of templates I have and then just build out the, the pertinent parts. Um, the one I, I use for that is called BidSketch, although I'm not totally happy with it. There's, um, there's one coming out right now. It's called Newsly, N-U-S-L-I-I, I think, that looks like it's uh, going to be pretty good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not wedded to any in particular. I find that it really comes down to personal preference and you know, what, your, what your inclination is for managing stuff. I'm a paper guy too. You know, I bring notebooks. Often I go and I have a project in Belmont I'm working on. I go down, I bring my iPad and a bunch of paper and everybody's like, you're the designer, where's your computer? I'm like, we're gonna have a much more effective conversation if I can draw it right here and you're not feeling like you can't either. So we can both draw on it. Then they feel like they can participate. It becomes a conversation. We're working on something here. It's a very different experience. Then there's a, that's one other aspect to the done list is when we used to write with pens, you could see the results of your work that day. You were editing, crossing out, rearranging, rewriting. Now it's like, it's the same. You can look at history or whatever, but it sort of doesn't really quite make sense. So it's hard for us to tell that we've been actually doing work. So paper's a killer tool, killer app. Um, I love your philosophy. That, that's really nice. In, you know, looking at your goals and alignment of clients and whether they get you closer to your goals. But I want to go back for a second to your software. You mentioned BitSketch. I kind of share your feelings. Uh, I'm looking for a better um, bidding program. Um, but project management, have you found anything? Because uh, Backpack doesn't do it for me, and you know, I just haven't found anything good for project management. Depends what, uh, what aspect of project management you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, involving other people, so yeah. Yeah, so for collaboration, it kind of depends. Um, I use Asana for task and project management that way with, when I'm organizing with other people. But um, I find that most of the project management tools are, are, very, are too heavy-handed. You know, there's just, they're trying to do too much for too many people. And especially as freelancers, usually our needs are very limited. You know, typically, I'm not giving my clients access to the project management tools. Yeah. So it's like, it's about communication with them, not like, hey, go look in this system. I've gotten a few clients from other folks who essentially left them because they made them go into a project management system to communicate. And I was like, if that's not working for you, then great, let's ditch it. Like, if you want to call and you want to email, like, that's what I mean about customer service. Like, meet them. Don't make them come to you because you're in the service of them. They're paying you. So unless they're willing to get on board, Whatever tool you use is you know, going to defeat the purpose if they're not into it. Yeah, so then you're kind of back to email, like when you want to get um, what's the status on this project and you're still working on it, and so you're going to need to stop and update them. How do you deal with that when you don't have the results yet, but you do want to you know, let them know that you're there and you're working? Yeah, so I showed you I have a block here where I manage email. There's a block there. And depending on like if I'm, you know, this was a project where I'd, I'd coordinate in there with them. But it's email. <clears throat> People live in their inboxes. Why fight the river? Never-ending river, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's things like Slack and HipChat and stuff like that that allow for inter-team communication, which are awesome. I think those are great when you have a bigger team. But for clients, email, you know, especially as freelancers, most of the people that we're working with, they're not advanced enough to figure out something like Asana. I've heard of Asana, but Slack and HipJack, huh? Hip Jack? Slack. Slack's pretty cool. Slack. It's a, it's a communication network, basically. You can, yeah, a chat room, basically. It's sort of like a super, super advanced chat room. Let me just add, uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of these one-day sessions um, with clients. Like, uh, tomorrow I've got one. 
and I tell them to pick an instant messenger service of choice, and so we <coughs> often end up using Skype, not for the phone call feature, but just, just to have an ongoing chat, you know, back in the days of AOL instant messenger, like, <laughs> those are the days <laughs> where you just have one conversation and they can get you immediately when they know that you're working on that project for them. And that seems to work really well for me because you yeah. don't want hundreds of emails piling up every time anybody has <coughs> thought. You know. Yeah, that's a unique situation, I think. She does the one day sessions where it's like that's just what she's focused on. I don't typically have that sort of situation. I try and time shift things as much as possible so they're not waiting on me to get stuff done. But for instant communication, yeah. Sure. Yeah, totally. I mean, and that's why there's so many tools. I mean, Pivotal versus Jira. Like, well, they're both doing essentially the same thing. Yeah. Well, I can't uh, say thanks enough for the insight that you've given and the tools that you've developed. It's, it's very, I'm sure everybody here is uh, excited about what they've learned. And on that note, um, is there any way that you would make available the slides? Absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I didn't get to the last, the last slide there. There's just a little placeholder. I think actually maybe I haven't even published it yet. I haven't written up my notes all the way. Okay. But um, that'll be up, up soon. I wanted to make a comment. I realized when you gave your timeline, you and I have been freelancing for about the exact same amount of time, and a lot of the things that you said are exactly what I coach my clients through. So it was nice to just get reiteration that what I'm doing is, is working, and totally. I have a drawn out map very similar to yours. Um, but I noticed something in the last nine months or so, and I talk to teenagers a lot, and I have to guide them through the process of living a life without digital stuff, right? without being attached to a device. Yeah. So um, the National Institute of Health, National Sleep Study, one hour, give yourself one hour away from digital light before you go to bed. And yeah. in the last nine oh. months, I started sleeping. I thought I, was, I thought I was seven, seven and a half. No, it's like nine. I actually need a lot more sleep than I thought I did. Yeah. So um, I'm much more productive, and I tend to write code or write speeches or do whatever in my dreams. So <laughs> productive, productive sleep doesn't exist. But I also discovered that um, if I'm reading business books or I'm reading anything that's non I write nonfiction books. So if I read nonfiction, my brain never stops working. Yeah. My solution is Harry Potter, and I'm like on the 15th cycle. And every night I go, Harry Potter on a broom. And I'm out. But it works for me. But the sleep thing was huge. And what I've noticed since I've increased my sleep is that I'm happier, nicer to work with. Um, my life's a lot more relaxed, but I noticed everybody says this one word to me everywhere I go, busy. I'm yeah. so busy, you're so busy, we're busy, you must be so busy. And I realized it's not even a real concept anymore. It's just what everybody assumes. So I challenge you to not use that word and not think about yourself <clears throat> as busy. It's really difficult. And you're gonna realize how many times people say it every day, all day long. I'm not busy. I'm actually really relaxed. And everybody goes, what? I'm actually OK. So with sleep and turning the word busy upside down um, has had a huge impact on my life. Yeah. And I'm, everybody's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just relaxed. But you must not be busy. I have lots of work. Yeah. But I'm not busy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I actually give a presentation called Digital Distraction. And it addresses a lot of those things that we, we in our culture have these devices on us all the time. And that's what I was alluding to with the analog watch. Why do we pull out our phone most of the time? Like, check a phone, you know, check the time, or did I get any messages? When we do that, it disrupts that focus I was talking about, even our day-to-day -day focus. So we're having lunch with a friend. What did you just do? You totally disconnected from them. So how does that person feel now? Oh, well, that's okay. So now we're doing that to one another and we're losing that connection that we have as human beings. It's also like an age difference thing. Like, you know, and people, you know you, younger folks, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're like, oh, yeah, but you're like, oh, uh, I'm talking to you. you know? Well, th that, be that as it may, that's the problem. <laughs> but that's, that's fine. You know? <laughs> but that's the problem. Is that the direction we want culture to go? Where it's okay to be like, hey, yeah, you know, just, just a sec, guys. Like, do you, want, do you want to be treated that way? Cultural so, children do that, and I think that's fine, but it's not cultural for us as adults and professionals. I know, to that to each other. yeah, but still sometimes there's that, you know. Like, so they're coming up. Yeah. They're going to be the professionals soon. So my point is, let's be aware of that. And also we get distracted. We look for the time, 
and then we <laughs> unlock it, and then, and then yeah. you ever find yourself going, what was I supposed to be doing? <laughs> Literally, well, it takes you 30 seconds to remember. So exactly. if you check your phone, you check your time, 40 times a day, or that time, don't get distracted. Yeah, so, so the watch, the watch basically, if you look at a digital clock all the time, this is another executive function thing. When you look at the digital clock, if you want to estimate time between things or figure out how long till something, you have to do math. That's a pretty heavy executive function load. But if you can look at an analog clock, and you can gauge the distance between two things, you can get a ballpark for how much time has either passed or where it's going to go without having to engage your math functions. It's pretty heavy. I, ha I haven't worn a watch for 15 years. I got one about two months ago. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you had a question. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed hearing something from a younger man that resembles something that I do as well. <laughs> Great. Um, one thing I'd like to comment on, though, a lot of what I've learned in a similar fast-growing world, and I go back a little bit older than some of you, um, it's concentration management more than time management. Um, some of the executives I've had a chance to work with at <coughs> with some of the largest software companies in the world wouldn't even answer their phone. <coughs> sorry, they would not answer their email till noon, meaning yeah. you had to call them on the phone. And at the rules of thumb, if you sent more than three emails or texts back and forth, Damn well, better pick up the phone now because someone's going to be walking down the hall, knocking on your door. Yeah. Certain rhythms that we've gotten normal have become counterproductive. You just used the looking at your phone example. And I can't tell you how many times it annoys me as an exec to watch somebody looking at their phone. It's like they have, they're looking at their crush. I guess something important going on down there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a new normal, perhaps, um, but it's not a sustainable one. Over enough time, they too will be uh, in a different period of time. Yeah. What and about all the people walking down the street? Well, there's Looking car accidents waiting to happen as we speak. But you know, um, it's a, it's. But back to the point, it's concentration <laughs> management, and you yeah. know, these days with Sorry. various drugs that I, I see youth much. doing, and <laughs> you know, that could be Especially caffeine, sure. five hour, you know, Adderall, Adderall, whatever it is, that is exactly counter to what you're saying about the sleep. And I, I want to emphasize the sleep you know, and exercise components. And I thought I'd practice them. Um, <laughs> but when at the height of my activity, when I was like burning incredible number of projects, everything was time sliced so click quickly. And there's a great book called the, the uh, is it The Power of Routines? Power of Habits. Power of Habits. Yeah, that's a good one. It's a particularly good like book it. on how our bodies are, are in the autopilot half the day. And the more you can do that, the more you can concentrate. And if you yeah. can get three or four hours of concentrated time, you're going to feel really good. Yeah. Most of us get like 10 seconds, you know, yeah. and then like, you know, squirrel, you know, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you have to kind of aggressively protect that creative time. But you do, I mean, if you train your, if you're lucky enough to tell your clients that, you know, you will be available by phone all day long, but email you will not respond till noon. You just set out your own block of time that you know this is your work productive time or yeah. schedule whatever it might be. That's why that schedule is so advantageous is because I can be very clear about when I can get to something. So someone calls, hey, we, this emergency, whatever. It's like, okay, you know what? Like today I had someone call like, we need a meeting this afternoon. Sorry, tomorrow morning's the earliest I can do it. Why is that such a big deal? Like, is anybody, anything going to happen? Like. Well, it'll be a few hours later. OK, great. Let me know when the meeting is tomorrow. So <laughs> you know, it's really, you have to be clear about it. And that's the problem. That's why I'm, I talk to teenagers about it. I want them to be aware that there's an other way of operating. Because if they're not, and they just think that's the default, that's going to be culture. Mm. And the risk that we run, the cost is way too high for losing our capacity to think deeply and creatively. That's what our most valuable asset is as human beings, is to come up with new solutions. That's why we do what we do. That's why we're the powerful ones, because we have these big brains. And if we're training it day in and day out for quick distraction, for shallow thinking, what are we going to get? We're going to get Baywatch and things like that. You know? I mean, that's, that's the height of culture. I haven't watched television in probably 10 years, because I'm like, why is that serving me? How is that serving me? Being aware of like what Miley Cyrus is doing, like pff, 
Sorry, she's not making the world a better place. I have kids. I want them to grow up in a world that I'd like to see. So thank you for your comment. Yeah. It's energy. I, I love the idea of concentration management because that's, I, I wrote a book about my whole one day build thing. Mm, right. uh, one day web designer is the name of the book. And um, I don't just coach people just how to run a session. I kind of train them how to kind of get in the mindset of running something like that. And it's, it's, it's not done normally because it's so hard to concentrate for an entire day when you're working virtually alongside with a client. So I, I kind of tell people to use what I call the over the shoulder method to kind of train them, their brains into being more productive. So if you imagine when you're working on a project like normal that your client is right there next to you or, or they're kind of waiting for the results, you're kind of able to focus more. So if you make it a point to not answer phone calls and not look at Facebook for, yeah, like an extended chunk of time, then you hit the end of the day and you're like, oh my god, how much did I just get done? That's amazing. The thing is, though, is I can't, sus that's not the thing for me anyway that I can sustain on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not able to book, you know, four sessions in a week. That'd be crazy. Like, I can't do more than two. Um, but yeah. yeah, if you're interested in this energy management stuff, I'd suggest looking at, I think his name is Cal Newport. He's a professor at some, some college. He thinks about this stuff a lot. He has some really interesting, interesting thoughts about managing energy and effectiveness and things like that. I was curious, so kind of along those lines, you talked about, you know, you have the, the 90 minute blocks. And as you know, I do creative work all day long, I'm always thinking about, you know, kind of coming to what I do with a fresh mind. What do you do when you hit, when you're done at 60 minutes? I mean, how does that affect your schedule? What do you do, what do, you do then? You know what I mean? Well, it depends on what the project I was working on and what other things I have to work on. Because if it's, if it's something I need to sink into again, like the next block is something big, then I'll, I'll finish email or you know, go work on email or make a phone call or whatever. But I make sure that I have that gap in between still so that I can become clear. Keep that same structure and just find something to kind of fill your time. Until you yeah, I mean, there's always more work to do, so <laughs> jump into email and coordinate that way or whatever. Typically in the morning, I don't do that. You know, if I have some time, I'll find another creative thing or if I pulled it down, but I'll look for a project that's like, okay, I think it's only going to take a half an hour. They need this updated or whatever. I'll go and do that sort of thing. But I try to really keep it clear and, and separate. Mm -hmm. You know, you just said, I think it's going to take half an hour. I've thought that, and then it ends up taking three hours. <laughs> yeah, how do you handle that? Because I, I've, had, I've had times where I've had five or six projects going on, and every morning I'm writing apology emails. Well, I'm going to be late by a day, late by a day, late by a day, five or six people, because one, one, one project expanded so big that it pushed everything else down, and I'm in crisis. Yeah. Uh, you, how about being able to estimate... Particularly for me, because I'm self-taught, I don't know how to do certain things, so I figure I can do it pretty quickly. I'm looking through manuals, you know, code and like that. H how do you um, um, handle when you get huge time explosions that you're, or either you're a bad estimator like I am? How do you, how do you, um, how do you work as a, that's what kills me as a freelancer. Yeah. Yeah, two things actually. I almost left the slides in. I gave a presentation last year called The Business of Design where I talked about estimating and running it. And fundamentally, it comes down to data. So what I do is, in my estimation, I have a spreadsheet where I have sort of a basic project that I, I've done before. And I have it broken out into certain tasks, things like the business development, the onboarding, the process and discovery, you know, design, slicing the design, you know, all those different aspects if it's like a website and put estimations in based on what I think it will take. That gives me my sort of project status, it's at the budget and everything like that. But what I do in Harvest, this is, that's my time tracking app, for each project, I have tasks that correlate directly to those estimates. And so when I put the project into Harvest, like they're ready to go, 
I move those estimates from my, my original estimate into harvest. So each task, like design, will have a time associated with it. And so when I'm doing the project, I can look and see, you know what? That particular component is consistently taking seven hours instead of five hours. And so then I go back to my default, like blank template, it's not a blank template, but it's sort of my starter template. And I look at it and say, okay, well that, that particular component needs to be seven hours now. So the next time I do a project, it starts at seven. And then over time, it gets more and more accurate. The other thing that I do is I double my original estimate. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go through a project and I'll sort of break it out into the specific tasks. And then I'll like sit down and go, okay, that particular piece, if I sat there and coded it, this is what it's going to look like. And then I double that. And that tends to be pretty accurate. If you're just starting out, triple it. You might have to charge them less because you're like, yeah, that's going to take 500 hours. Sorry. <laughs> but that, that adjustment for the time allows you to take into consideration that, that extension. The other thing that I didn't show on my week schedule is I have typically two open blocks. So that's three hours in the week where I can have flex. So if it goes over here, I, I also didn't show, I'll pull it up. If it goes over uh, the time, this one got bumped. There was one block for this project that got bumped off of here. So I moved that one into the bumped list, and that goes into an open slot on the next week. I might have a bunch here if like, that whole day ended up getting taken up with that thing. So I'm able to sort of move things around because I have that macro view. Without that macro view, it's insanity. You're just like, okay, well, God, I don't know. How do I, how do I coordinate that now? Where do I fit them in? How do I tell them when I'm going to do it? If you can look at it a couple weeks out, you're set. It, and then you're, not, then you're not having to make those awkward, like, push it out, push it out, push it out, push everybody out. And it might be that that one client who I wasn't able to finish that piece of work on might end up waiting until next week to finish it. And that's also the benefit of having that lag time to say, you know what, I take the time to do it right. So it might be a little bit longer than you're expecting. But I've found in most situations, unless it's like a trade show, there's no deadline. It's totally arbitrary. So if you have the discussion with them, if you want it to be quality, it will take the time it takes. If you want it fast, great. Then we'll get it out fast, but it's going to suck. So, <laughs> Do you want it to suck? Usually they don't. <laughs> They're willing to wait. So, so do you have like a pamphlet or a PDF that you send a client that's just like all about your deadlines are imaginary? <laughs> <laughs> no, I find those conversations are best had in person. <laughs> you know, I, I really make an effort to have the first meeting with the client be in person so you can build rapport, you can get to know them a little bit, you can have that high touch experience and in that, the quality conversation comes up, the timeline conversation comes up, what the expectations for when I'll reply, those sorts of things. Uh, just be clear about them. Like, if you're clear, they can make the choice of whether they want to work with you or not. If it doesn't work for them, they're like, God, man, he's going to wait a day to get back to me. I can't work with that. Like, okay, that's great. But up front, honesty again. You want to build trust. I was just going to mention that I found a system called Pomodoro that blocks yeah. you know, 30 minutes where you have 25 minutes and then you have a five minute break. That's yep. really helpful for the folks managed. It's not about task management. So much, yeah. but you have to actually articulate what it is you're working on. I put that on a post it, like right there on, on the yeah. thing. And then, it, and then there's, uh, there's some software tools where you can use it in the kitchen timer. Yeah, the, the tomato timer. Tomato timer or whatever. <laughs> but it, I found that really good for. for yeah, I tried that for a while, and um, I found that the chunks were too small. I couldn't get enough work done in 25 minutes, and all the apps are like, 25 minutes. I'm like, you're not going to make it adjustable? So I kind of made my own system. I think that was probably part of the inspiration for it, was to say that focus time is really key, but 25 minutes wasn't enough. Yeah, for me, it's more just sort of, it's 25 minutes, and then you 
and then you have to like an enforced five minute. <coughs> yeah, like freezes your battery, screen. Yeah. And then and then you back it to another block of that and you can do that three times in a row or whatever. Yeah, there's some good literature on the Pomodoro technique online. Where I think there's even a book that someone wrote about it. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. I have a lifestyle question. How do you manage both planned and um, maybe spontaneous family time, vacations, time away from work? Um, you know, if you want to spend a, a Wednesday at the beach with your kids, you know, how do you how do you do that? Yeah. So you either block it out, or Know that move that day to another day, move it on to the weekend if you really, you know, if you absolutely have to get the work done. And that's part of the advantage of being freelancers. You set your own schedule. You know, so. <laughs> well, yes and no. There's different freedoms. I actually was going to put that in the beginning to talk about some of the advantages of being a freelancer, some of which are the freedom to choose your clients. Mm -hmm. That's a really big one. You know, I don't want some jackass telling me what I need to be doing. Like, I want to be that jackass. <laughs> exactly along those lines, do you have a, like a secret list where you qualify the quality of your, of your clients and which ones will get priority and which ones you know, may or may not, depending on your busyness? There are, you can pay me rush if you'd like to be priority, but otherwise it's the order that you come in. And I really focus on giving each client that, that focused attention. Because if you're a small client, like, why should you get less attention than some big client? Because for you, they're the same need. So I typically have that qualification on whether I take the project or not, not when I'm giving them the time. Well, how about your filter? Um, clients who have had problems with previous web developers and you see possible that you could be the next one with problems. <laughs> Usually you can tell in the meeting. Usually you can tell when you're talking to them. And typically what I find is the other developer wasn't actually listening. Um, have you had any that um, were just problem clients and you see that coming? And do you have a way of dumping them? Or do you have a list of people that you would um, voice them upon? <laughs> no, I, it, it, again, it's, it's that initial sort of vet, you know, gauge them in the meeting, gauge based on the client. You know, if you're clear on what type of work you want to do, based on those values and your motivation for being a freelancer and stuff, it's, a no, it's really no question. You know, I have people come to me, it's like there was some guy who's opening a church locally. I'm like, awesome for you. I'm not really into Christianity. So, like, you know, I'm not going to take that job. So it's just right there. And for problem clients, typically in my experience, the client is not the problem. Hear that. <laughs> <laughs> typically, <laughs> typically it's not, if you can listen to them properly, then they'll be heard and you can work out what needs to be worked out. But if you're not listening, all kinds of problems happen. Interesting, yeah. I, it, I mean, they're human beings too, and that's part of the empathy, is to say, what actually is going on for this person? They probably got some Yahoo above them, hammering on them to get it done, and you're the one who's getting the brunt of it because you were you know, the last one in the chain. It's not them. They're not an awful client. They have constraints on them. Most people want to be nice. Most people are not trying to put you in a bad position. And if you manage the projects properly, in my experience anyway, I, I don't really have bad clients. I've been doing this for, like I said, I've been almost eight years now working for myself and like I haven't had those situations. Wow, you're kind of their psychologist as well. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. That's what it means to be a freelancer. Right, we've got time for one more question. We've got to be out of here about 9.30. So. I just wanted to comment. You mentioned the word listening a lot. However, you somewhat use the word need and want interchangeably. I think one of the key is that you listen to them, they say what they want, but what you need to hear is what they need. Sure, certainly. I mean, that's sort of implicit in, in any interaction. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, listening is a skill that we lose when we're all distracted. So that's, you know, you want to do good work, you need to listen to what they're asking for. I had a project recently where somebody wanted a logo, and the people who had been working with them came up with, I don't know, 25 different iterations of it. And I went through. They sent me all the communication and all the different logos. 
And I basically went through it and was like, okay, what happened here? And essentially, the client had been saying, yeah, we'd like to see this with that, and can you adjust it this way? And they'd come up with some new logo. I was like, it's right there. They asked you what they wanted, and now you're upset because they don't like what you're presenting? Like, it's just simple listening, like paying attention. And that's what you get when you have the focus. That focus, it comes back to just being present and focusing on what you're doing. Do one thing at a time. That should be the sort of final rule of thumb. One thing at a time. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.